So I work at the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology, that is University College London, and uh, we are specializing in eye disease in every form. I'm particularly interested in the biochemistry and early biochemistry occurring in age-related macular degeneration. And uh, I'm uh, from the Uni University of Maryland School of Medicine in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and most of our work focuses on uh, studying uh, biology generally, particularly biology of metals, using fluorescence methods. Tell us about the current research that you are undergoing. You want to start? Yeah. You start. Well, um, uh, Dr. Lengel and I are very interested in the biology of, of, of zinc in the retina, and uh, we were planning to uh, have him come to our laboratory and do some experiments. Uh, this is a little while ago, and uh, he, working with uh, Tony Lanzarotti, and uh, you'll have to prompt me for the names, um, Jane Flynn, Jane Flynn uh, at the uh, synchrotron, mm -hmm. had discovered that there was uh, using an X-ray diffraction that there was a, uh, uh, inside these drews and these deposits in the retina are, which your audience is very familiar with, um, that there's hydroxyapatite there. And w when Imre told me that, um, I was very puzzled and, and skeptical, but we were able to find some fluorescent dyes, actually, that are used for studying bone growth um, that uh, enable us to, to selectively label the hydroxyapatite deposits in the, in the retina. Um, and then, Subsequently, Imre did a great experiment where he showed that, that these little spherules, these little hollow spherules, they're microscopic, they're very small uh, in the retina, are coated with uh, proteins that are typical of, uh, of age-related macular degeneration. Um, and I guess I should let you take it. So that became so interesting and important for us uh, in my laboratory because we want to understand how the disease actually starts. Mm -hmm. We now have some treatment uh, opportunities at the later stages, but we still don't know how the disease starts. So uh, I was particularly excited about finding that these little spherules, which we identify in Drusen, uh, they're made of this particular material called, as Richard said, hydroxyapatite. What's interesting about this molecule is as a biochemist uh, in high school already, uh, started to separate proteins using this material because it's used for protein purification, protein separation, because it binds proteins. So suddenly we had an idea that why proteins start to get trapped and develop into drusen, into this big mass of protein and lipid uh, deposits. So this was a very exciting uh, finding because first we now have an idea why proteins get trapped and retained uh, above the or part of the Brooks membrane. Secondly, it was very exciting because we started to be able to bring together different ideas developing in the last 15, 20 years. So one of the interesting observations was that when people did immuno uh, staining for different drusen associated proteins, several of those showed this spherular formation. And there is no real explanation why that particular really symmetric immunostaining occurs in drusen and uh, it was very interesting to find that with amyloid beta uh, which has been uh, shown by Lynx Johnson and, and his colleagues and then complement factor H uh, by Greg Hageman. So very important, very interesting studies showing this but there is no explanation why they would form this particular structure. So this brought together several aspects which we already knew about it. We knew that there is calcification there, we knew that there are proteins there, but there is no explanation why these actually get trapped there and retained there. I was going to say one of the one of the interesting aspects from my standpoint was that it was hydroxyapatite, which is the form of calcium phosphate that's in your teeth and in your bones, which just sounded crazy to me and, and as perhaps a lot of your, your viewers know, um, in, when you're remodeling bone, the way that that's done is with acid. I mean, there are specialized cells in the bones that, that do this. And so it, it, it struck me because 
this this is a very a very strong material. It's very 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 inert, hard to get rid of. So we uh, it really was striking. So is this a membrane transfer problem? Why does the hydroxyapatite get trapped in this particular area? Is it a is it a membrane transport problem? Is it an efflux problem? What do you think it is? So one of the reasons why we organized this special interest group, which will happen this afternoon, is bringing together expertise on calcium, by uh, the, the, the biology of calcium, mm -hmm. uh, because it is very unusual. Our body is full of calcium, full of phosphates, but we still don't crumble. <laughs> we do age, and one of the issues with aging that there is this uh, uh, rigidity <clears throat> in different tissues like the skin start crin uh, become crinkly because of calcification. So calcification is part of the normal um, process but it, 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 this kind of calcification is unique and that's very important to emphasize here that, that the calcification which we have in the kidney as a kidney stone or in the skin when we get wrinkle, wrinkles uh, are different. Hydroxyapatite formation is not a trivial calcification process. In fact, usually it goes through several stages of recrystallization re and, and reformation. So it's a unique um, <clears throat> structure and it's, it's, it's a very important to understand why suddenly in the eye we start seeing this. It's also important because the eye is not the only place where this actually happens. It happens in atherosclerosis. Exactly the same process. When I say exactly the same, it's very similar. At the end point is the formation of these hydroxyapatite deposits. But it's still there are some differences that distinguish atherosclerosis from these uh, hydroxyapatite formations. But as you ask the question why, uh, it is a very important question. Obviously, the calcium level in the extracellular space is fairly high, and it's extremely well re regulated that it doesn't flood the cells because it would kill the cells unless the cell needs that calcium signal. So there is a very tight regulation of calcium levels, but still there is no calcification or calcium phosphate in a normal state. <laughs> Sorry about that. It does happen when something goes wrong and uh, if we call wrong aging <laughs> but so 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 we, uh, something is going out of alignment when calcium and phosphate suddenly meets and then precipitation of phosphate calcium phosphate now are you looking at the entire picture of calcium regulation and calcium metabolism because it's obviously we know that there are certain individuals that develop hypercalcemia develop kidney stones develop ectopic calcium deposition are you looking at it at a systemic level or specifically focusing on the microenvironment of the retina? I, I would say the, the more the microenvironment. I mean, I think, it, as you've mentioned, there's, there's really a good bit known about, at least about the, the cell biology of, of calcium, its regulation, transport, and the like, um, how it, and how it's regulated systemically you know, by hormones and so forth. Um, so we're really more focused on what has changed in the retina to, that now, now allows this process that we think is pathologic to occur. Well, as you know, that we have you know, drugs, we have interventions that can reduce serum calcium. We use them for the treatment of, of both acute and chronic hypercalcemia. Are you positing that perhaps these approaches might be useful for changing the microenvironment of the retina as well as systemically? Um, we're certainly thinking in those terms because there's a very exciting um, paper that just came out um, by Dr. Shin Shin Lin, Shin Lin uh, from I believe from UCLA, who's going to be at, at our special interest group, where he has shown that, and, and I don't want to misstate it, but that um, uh, persons who had uh, uh, been taking calcium supplements at a relatively high level, 800 milligrams, um, seem to have a greater risk for AMD. And I think it's it's an it's an early finding, but it's very very provocative, and you know we're certainly very interested in it. It's also an interesting issue because a lot of people take uh, calcium uh, supplements, especially in terms of osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. So there are conditions where increased calcium 
systemically can occur. So uh, a little bit connecting back to your previous question, uh, although we are looking at the microenvironment where Drusen deposit, uh, deposits, it is very likely that is co uh, is connected quite strongly to the systemic environment uh, what is presented in, in these patients. So hypocalcemia uh, uh, or hypophosphatemia, uh, as just, just mentioned a couple. As you know, there are drugs such as al uh, alendronate or Fosamax, which are used for postmenopausal women predominantly to deal with osteoporosis, and they change uh, the density and the deposition and the site of distribution of calcium. Has anybody actually looked at the impact of these drugs that mobilize and move calcium in terms of the eye impact? The, the, the short answer is, is, is probably unlikely that anyone would have looked at because there wasn't really a, a good reason to do it. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason, the, the puzzle is just being put together uh, that we have this calcification issue. Is there other relevant things which we missed in the past? I mean, it probably is uh, not related, but you can start thinking about that whoever is taking these drugs might or might not develop, or in fact, we could use these drugs to actually combat the cause of calcification. So, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, there's sort of no reason to use this, this, this drug which is being used for women of childbearing age in older people, but maybe now there is. And, and these are the sorts of things that we're just beginning to investigate and try to evaluate the, you know, the value of such therapies. So, taking off from your current research that you presented here, what are the specific next steps for this path? So, because this is a completely new uh, phenomena, I think it opens the opportunity to, to start developing some new ideas. For example, we don't yet know why these deposits, uh, why this calcification occurs uh, in these ferrular shapes. We know that it's related to lipids, uh, the core of these, these um, uh, spherules are, are made of lipids and on the surface the calcium deposition occurs or hydroxyapatite deposition occurs. So it raises the question can we interfere with this because one of the important thing here to consider is that once hydroxyapatite is there it is there to stay. It's very very tough material. The only thing that it can uh, that can really resolve it is acid and we don't suggest uh, spurting coca-cola into anyone's eye but uh, it, it's a very important uh, thing to understand once it's there it's going to stay there so stopping that to develop might actually help us to combat the disease at a very early stage and uh, also, as a consequence of that, when proteins bind to it, if we can interfere with that, we might be able to block, even if the spherules are there, the built up of deposits or at least slow down their, their, their growth. And I would like Richard to explain a, an even more exciting, well, well at least as exciting well, part of it in terms of uh, diagnostic uh, opportunities. Well, we're, we're very fortunate to, we've uh, Together we've obtained funding from the Bright Focus Foundation and one of the things that we're focusing on with, uh, with that effort is to try and understand this phenomenon, understand it in the, in the context of are people getting um, hydroxyapatite in their retinas, how early and if, if those people have, got, uh, uh, have other risk factors for AMD that are well known, uh, dyslipidemia, um, uh, smoking and, and the like as well as the genetic risk factors. Um, and what we're hoping to do is to make this into a, is this will work out to be a, a way to see AMD before it's usually diagnosed, which is usually ex post facto. I mean, the patient comes in and, and pre essentially presents with loss of vision, which is irreversible. Um, I mean, uh, clearly the, the VEGF inhibitors have, have been fantastic drugs for helping people with wet AMD, but. For the, for the majority of cases who, who have so-called dry AMD, um, there's really not much to be done. I mean, there's a, great, there's a great deal of work being done in terms of new treatments and therapies, but uh, I think that it'll be very useful to identify 
folks who are at risk early on as as is being done genetically now, but in in terms of a a screening test that might be used for a very large population. So we're very excited about that as really, you know, know, putting a stick in the spokes of the whole, you know, AMD uh, disease process. So essentially what you're trying to do is to create the general theory of macular degeneration. Something Uh, like that. Something like that. Because I think that really, uh, to my mind, is a very, very important contribution. A lot of people have pieces of the puzzle, but putting the puzzle together remains a significant and important challenge. I think, it, uh, I think it's very important to, to not overstate our work. One thing which we are fairly comfortable to say is that this is a very early event, and, in, uh, and it helps these deposits to build. And of course, the jury is out there uh, to decide whether Drusen deposition is cause or consequence. But we are comfortable to say that because Drusen deposition is associated with AMD, deposition of hydroxyapatite will have a bearing of the early events and how this eventually lead to end stage disease, now vascularization or geographic atrophy. That's one of the pieces of the puzzle which we try to at least raise at this uh, special interest groups because it comes, this work came out exactly the time when um, uh, Kirsten Curcio's uh, 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 team started to look at calcified drusen, which is of course very strongly associated with dry AMD. Uh, so and geographic atrophy. So, so it's, it's a very interesting uh, relationship. Suddenly two paper completely independently reports a clinical finding mm-hmm. and we report a basic science finding and the two actually really matches off wonderfully. So it's an, a very exciting time where basic science meets uh, clinical science. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the things that, that, that we found is that I mean, this method, this this uh, you know, standing of tissue for uh, for hydroxyapatite is a fairly straightforward procedure, and so we think it's going to find immediate use as a research tool for people studying AMD for many different aspects. Uh, so we're uh, we, we think that's all kind of fun. And uh, uh, I would like to put this uh, potential staining or early detection methodology into a bit of a context. The dyes which we use to visualize hydroxyapatite are dyes that can be excited uh, at uh, the same wavelength and with the same machines that are used for in the cyanide green uh, uh, angiography. And uh, we have some basic uh, research uh, work done in, 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 in laboratory environment, not on patients which shows that we can beautifully highlight very tiny changes up to 20 mi- or less than 20 micron changes already with clinically available uh, uh, equipment. So there is, a, there is a, an opportunity here because normally clinicians can only see drusen and quantify drusen once they reach a certain size. Here we might have an opportunity to capture this two, three, four micron sized little spherules because of their very intense fluorescence when it's bound to this dye. So there is an opportunity to visualize very early events, probably 10, 15 years before uh, a clinical sign would be noted by the clinicians. I think that's very powerful because we're always looking for early markers so that we can intervene appropriately modify the otherwise inexorable natural history of the disease. Well, one of the, one of the desirable potential features, I should say, of, of hydroxyapatite as a marker is it's pretty stable. It, uh, it doesn't go away. It's not transient. It, it, you know, in your bones, obviously, you remodel these things um, as needed, but, but this, uh, this calcification in the, in the retina, probably once it's there, it's there, and it's uh, going to be very easy to detect if it is. Turning now to translational implications, the first set of questions relate to the translational implications for clinicians. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. I, I think for for us really, uh, uh, which we just talked about, this potential of using these um, 
these deposit formations as early markers and using uh, infrared dyes to visualize these these deposits or maybe later on we will understand a little bit more about the chemistry and we can we can use other imaging modalities but the the opportunity for a clinician to to identify this deposit formation which would be an early sign of some kind of this homeostasis would mean that um, we might have a handle on capturing a, a process early and then if we interfere with that we could monitor whether we can slow down further deposit formation or what happens in the eye. So I think to me uh, the, the, the real excitement comes from the potential to an early detection and this becomes very interesting when we start thinking about <coughs> not just <coughs> age-related macular degeneration, but all those diseases where extracellular deposit formation or drusen formation is associated with Alzheimer's disease. We have some evidence uh, associated with drusen formation. There are other kidney-related uh, uh, problems where, where drusen deposition occurs, other dementia uh, problems. So we have a little bit of a space to play with at the moment to try to understand how all these extracellular deposit formations could be detected and in a in a normal clinical setting after all although not everyone is using and in the cyanide green uh, uh, angiography but the equipments and, uh, and 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 clinical tools are all available to do that well i i think the the thing that that, that i like to add is that um that this again is a potentially powerful research tool and as we understand the biology better of how it goes there it'll give us other opportunities in terms of potential therapies uh, but also I think we pretty strongly believe that uh, by analogy with with uh, you know cancer um, if you can find it early you basically have much more opportunity to stop it before it's before it's promulgated before it's become destructive and I think that you know, if we can stop AMD you know easily early you know, and, and, and I don't know what those therapies would be, um, but stopping it early before it's become damaging, something that's really, a, as you, all of your viewers know, is a hugely disabling disease, particularly in this country and the developed world. So um, we're, we're terribly excited, I guess is a fair statement. There are also opportunities. There are many, um, you, you pointed out that, that there are many diseases where we already use intervention uh, strategy. So this, this gives us a little bit of a, a new window, a new opportunity how to interfere with um, uh, processes leading to AMD. So it's a new, I think this is a new avenue which we can exploit both pharmaceutically, how to interfere with, with the formation or protein binding uh, and, and uh, and, and then later on how to detect this early enough and monitor changes. The final set of questions relate to the implications for patients. What can patients expect out of this particular line of research one year, five year, ten years from now? Well, I think uh, um, you know, this is still at a very early stage, at a discovery stage, but I think that as we look at it moving forward in, in the next, uh, over the next several years, I think that the likelihood is that we will come up with something that'll be a, you know, an early detection method for AMD, something that could be used in a screening process um, you know, for a very wide population, something that's going to be inexpensive. But as we go forward five, ten years out, we, as we understand this biology better, that we'll be able to, to you know, come up with a very selective interdiction, something, you know, if, if, if it's a dysregulation of, of, of calcium, for instance. You know, using some of the tools or adapting those tools for use in the retina, you know, is the sort of thing might, someone might think of, but that's going to take some time. So, you know, early detection, I think, is going to come earlier than, than uh, therapies, but again, as we understand the biology better, um, that that will, that will so, you know, suggest to us new approaches. It's also probably interesting to highlight, you know, one of the relatively successful uh, intervention in, in AMD uh, is through nutrition and we know how positive effects were achieved with zinc supplementation, vitamins and so forth. Now some more information emerging that other components and in this case very high intake of calcium could be a, 
an issue which people need to consider. It was actually very very interesting that before this study which showed that calcium supplement, uh, a high level of calcium intake is associated with increased risk, uh, our paper came out uh, probably a couple of months earlier than that study and the reaction from the public was I was getting emails from people that uh, so do you think I should stop uh, drinking a lot of milk. I'm drinking three, four pints of milk uh, a day. I don't drink water, I only drink milk. It's full of calcium. Do you think I have a higher chance to develop AMD? And uh, at that time I said, well, there is no indication in, in, in the literature as far as I know that calcium intake is a problem. But now we know that it is. it has the potential. So I think it, 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 it broadens our understanding and, and might help us to to monitor a little bit better how to how to use nutrition and alternative uh, ways um, to to interfere with disease progression. I'm I would like to stress that I'm not saying that really drinking milk uh, is is a problem, <laughs> but it it could be. So, so you're obviously familiar with AREDS-1, AREDS-2. Uh, the only proven intervention that has had any impact upon the natural progression of disease is indeed dietary. Do you see one aspect of your work being an extension of that, perhaps dietary calcium recommendations with regard to trying to forestall or uh, prevent macular degeneration? Be without trying to to be too smart and I, I will let Richard to explain that. In fact, one of the interesting aspects of, of calcium that it's a divalent metal ion just as zinc. So there could be an interplay between dietary supplementation of zinc and calcium homeostasis. But Richard is, uh, is, is, is really the expert on this who can explain this better. Well, and I, I, think, I think it's important to remember that um, you know, most of the, the folks who are obviously at risk for AMD are elderly, and frankly, zinc deficiency is much more common in elderly people. So, um, what I would state is that uh, you know, it, I think that you know, maintaining that that zinc supplementation, from my perspective, is a good idea. I think it's 27 milligrams in ARIDS too. Um, but I think that what our findings and Dr. Lin's findings su would suggest is we need to think very carefully about about calcium supplementation, you know, are, is, there, is there a good level, is there a bad level, is there a sweet spot, um, depending upon what, what, whether you're at risk for osteoporosis versus risk for AMD and those, those genetic risk factors that, that may obtain. So I, I think this, we've, we've added something to the story, but uh, I would be very surprised if, uh, if they're not, if they don't come of this, you know, more dietary recommendations. And as you said, this has been a successful approach in, in minimizing the, the effect of AMD. So uh, uh, we're, uh, in a sense, we're very pleased about the whole thing. Gentlemen, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, I think one thing which I, I would like to, to point out, I mean, we were concentrating on calcium and, and, and talking about zinc, but we know that, for example, vitamin D is very important in the calcium uh, homeostasis. So, and calcium D, uh, calcium D, uh, vitamin D supplementation is something which which uh, a lot of people recommend. So we, we need to, to start building a, a little bit of understanding of not just calcium, but what else is going to be important in understanding how calcium homeostasis might be changing in case we are doing something bad instead of something good. Yeah, I, the only thing that I would, would add to that is that I think that this, uh, this becomes another argument for, for basic research. I mean, we sort of started out looking for a very, uh, yeah, sort of very ba basic question, made a really an unexpected finding, and that uh, sort of catalyzed this whole thing. And I think what it says is that the value of basic research in trying to understand these fundamentally biological questions is leading to things that are really going to have translational importance in the, and, and benefiting patients uh, with a little luck here all over the world. Gentlemen, thank you for your groundbreaking and insightful work. Thanks very thank much. Thank you very much.